Today, we're going to be completing a full celestial position fix. I'm going to show you how to turn a sextant reading into an accurate position that you can use on a chart. Before you watch this video, I highly recommend you watch the other videos in this series, calculating an azimuth of a star, calculating an amplitude of a star, finding the time of sunrise, the celestial sphere, and all of the sextant tutorials. From now on, I'll assume you already know the techniques we covered in those videos. So, let's start by thinking about how a celestial position fix actually works. The whole idea of it is that you take a rough estimate of your position, and then you calculate exactly where you expect to see a selection of celestial bodies. You can use stars, the sun, the moon, or planets for this, but today we're just going to use stars to keep things simple. After calculating the altitude you expect for your stars, you can then measure the actual altitudes using a sextant. Chances are your estimated position was not actually your correct position. This means the altitudes of the stars you measure will be different to the altitude you calculated. You take those differences and you can use them to correct your estimated position. If you measure enough stars, you can sufficiently correct your estimated position to give you an accurate position fix. And really, that's all there is to it. Today I'm going to show you one technique, how to do it by manually calculating the altitude of different stars around a single estimated position. Another good way is to kind of fiddle a different estimated position for each star, so that the numbers become round. And this lets you read altitudes and azimuths directly out of rapid sight reduction tables. Anyway, on to today's technique. To start, we need our initial data. The date's going to be 15th of November 2018, and we want to get a set of morning sights. So we'll be looking at sunrise and civil twilight. We know that the previous day, civil twilight was around 6.30 in the morning, so we expect similar today. We planned ahead and found our 6.30 estimated position from the chart. 29 degrees, 42.2 minutes north, 037 degrees, 02.5 minutes west. To get that, we just applied our course and speed to last night's evening sights. Our course was 000 degrees true, and our speed was 12 knots. We need to start by getting an accurate time to take our sights. So we need to manually calculate the time of the morning civil twilight on the 15th of November 2018 in our position. We'll use the Nautical Almanac that's available from the nauticalalmanac.com, so pop over there and get a copy if you want to follow along. From the 15th of November page, we find that 30 degrees north, civil twilight is at 6 o'clock UTC in Greenwich, and at 20 degrees north, civil twilight is at 5.46 UTC in Greenwich. At our latitude of 29 degrees, 42.2 minutes north, we can interpolate to find that civil twilight is at 6 o'clock UTC on the Greenwich meridian. To turn that into civil twilight at our longitude, we need to work out longitude in time by dividing our longitude of 37, 0.2.5 minutes, by 15, and that gives us a 2 hour, 28 minute time difference. Of course, things in the west happen later, so we need to add that to the 6 o'clock civil twilight time to get civil twilight at our position at 8.28 UTC. If we wanted that in ship's time, we would just modify it using our time zone, which would give us 6.28 local time. I don't want it in local time until the very end though, as we're working in the almanac and leaving it in UTC is just, just easier. If that was too quick, check back to the video on calculating sunrise times to see it all in a bit more detail. The next step is to plan the sites that we want to take. You can use the star finder, but we haven't looked at that yet, so instead we're just going to say we know the constellations and we pick the stars by looking at the sky an hour before sunrise. We'll choose Betelgeuse, Sirius, Capella, Arcturus, Duby, and Regulus. All we want is a good spread of the brightest stars right across the sky. We plan six, as chances are there'll be cloud covering some of them, so hopefully we can shoot at least three to get our fix. To plan, I want the azimuths and altitudes of each of the stars at 8.30 UTC, in our estimated position. For today, I've already done the sums and I found the altitudes and azimuths of each of our six stars. We'll have to do it accurately after the sites anyway, so I won't go through the method in this step. We can then plot our stars onto a sheet of paper that we take with us onto deck when we take our sights. 
This helps locate the stars when dimmer ones begin to disappear as the sun is rising. I've just plotted their azimuths and written in their altitudes, although you could adjust the line lengths to reflect altitudes if you wanted. I also plot the ship's head as it gives me a reference point when I'm on deck, in this case 000 degrees true. Now you're ready to take the sights. For every sight you take, you need to log the precise time, and we're talking accuracy to the second here. Make sure you've adjusted your watch or the chronometer to give you enough accuracy. I tend to scribble straight onto my planning sheet just to keep all my notes together. You'll need to log the index error, every star's sextant altitude, and the precise time you shoot each sight. Make sure to check out the sextant tutorial series to see how to minimise errors, measure index error, and take accurate sights. In our example today, we managed to shoot Duby, Arcturus, and Regulus, but the others were obscured by cloud. That's fine though, I'm happy to work with just the three today. Now we're on to the calculations. Remember, we said that the principle was to compare our sextant measurements to our calculated measurements. This tells us we need to turn our sextant measurements into properly accurate measurements, and we'll need to calculate each star for the precise time that we shoot it. Let's start with the easy bit. We'll correct our sextant altitudes to be true altitudes. I'm going to construct a table as we've got a number of corrections to make. Firstly, we know that we need to apply the index error. Ours was 0.3 minutes off the arc, so we need to add 0.3 minutes to each measurement. Next, we need to correct for our height of eye. Let's keep it simple and say we were standing really low, just above the surface of the water. I can add on my height and I find the sextant was about 2 metres above the water. In an Admiralty Almanac, these corrections are all in the same book, but in the Almanac that we're using, they're in a separate document, but that's still available from the nauticalalmanac.com as well. Height of eye correction is dip, so we're just looking for the 2 metre row, and we get a correction of minus 2.5 minutes. Applying the dip and the index error to the sextant altitudes gives us the apparent altitude of each star. And there's only a few more corrections we need to make now. The total correction comes straight from that same page as the height of eye correction. You enter the stars and planets table with the apparent altitude, and you just read the total correction from the correct row. Then finally, we need to correct for refraction, or more precisely, the additional refractive correction. This is impacted by temperature and atmospheric pressure. It affects stars close to the horizon more than ones at a higher altitude. This morning it was 12 degrees C and 975 millibars when we took our readings, so we're going to read down column J. Two of our stars were high, so they didn't have any additional refractive correction. Arcturus was a bit lower, so we need to read off his correction, and we find it as plus 0.1 minutes. Finally, we can sum up all our columns to get the true altitude of each star, and we'll come back to these figures after finding our calculated altitudes. To get the calculated altitudes, we need that precise time of every site that we logged when we took the sites. Again, I'm going to do this in a table to display the data a little easier. This is the exact same method we used in the video on calculating the altitude of a star, so check that out if we go too quick today. I want to pull the data from the 15th of November page in the almanac. For each star, I'm going to want its sidereal hour angle and its declination. Then we need to turn those sidereal hour angles into local hour angles using Aries at the time of the sites. For Aries, we'll get the same hourly Greenwich hour angle for each site, as the hour for all of them was 8 o'clock UTC. It's going to be the increments for Aries that are different for each one. We can read off the increment for 28 minutes 15 seconds as 7 degrees 4.9 minutes. Then we can do the same for the 30 minute 30 second increment and the 32 minute 15 second increment. Next, we just add the hourly Greenwich Hour Angle of Aries to the increment to get the actual Greenwich Hour Angle of Aries at the precise time of each site. To turn that into a local hour angle, we need to apply our longitude, subtracting it because we're in the west. Finally, to get the local hour angle of the stars, we apply the sidereal hour angle of each star to the local hour angle of Aries at the precise time 
each star was shot. Starting to look a bit complex now, but it's quite simple provided you just follow through the steps logically. I'm going to remove the construction rows from my table now to only keep the rows that I'm interested in. Remember from the other video, to turn these into altitudes, we just need to plug the numbers through the formula. I want to keep it accurate enough to work with, so the angles are going to be to the nearest 0.1 minutes, and this should tie in with the accuracy possible with the sextant, and will correspond to 0.1 miles in the final result. Next, we want to find the actual azimuth of each star at the time of the site. Again, this was covered in the previous video on finding an azimuth of a star, so check that out for the thorough method. I use the ABC method, A being tan of the latitude divided by tan of the local hour angle, with the sine being opposite to the latitude sign, unless the local hour angle is between 90 and 270 degrees. B is tan of the declination divided by sine of the local hour angle, with the sine matching the sine of the declination. C can be either A minus B or B minus A, depending on which is largest, and is labelled the same as the sine of the largest of either A or B. Finally, the azimuth is the inverse tan of 1 divided by C divided by cos of the latitude, with the notation starting with the label of C and ending west if the local hour angle is less than 180 degrees, or east if the local hour angle is greater than 180 degrees. Resolving all that gives the azimuth in true notation. Again, this was really fast, so check out the video on azimuths if you want it slowing down. Finally, we can construct a table with only the information we now need. We take the star name, the time of the site, the azimuth, the true altitude, and the calculated altitude. Remember, I've said all along it's about comparing what you expect to see to what you actually see. For plotting, we want the difference between the true altitude and the calculated altitude. You just subtract the calculated altitude from the true altitude. Positive numbers are labelled towards, and negative numbers are labelled away. And now, we're almost ready to plot. But let's first have a look at what happens if we try and plot straight like this. We'll start at the origin, our estimated position, or DR position, at 8.30 UTC. To plot a star, you draw the azimuth, and then you plot the intercept perpendicular to that azimuth. For Doobie, the intercept was 0.4 miles towards. So we just move 0.4 miles towards Doobie, and we plot the celestial line of position. This was at 8.32.15. We can do the same for Arcturus. The azimuth was 0.82 degrees, and the intercept 4.5 miles towards. Again, we label it with the time, which was 8. 30 and 30 seconds. But this is where our issue comes in. The times of these lines are different. You can't plot a fix with lines of position taken at different times. You need to transfer the lines of position to get their times to match. We already said we wanted a fix at 8.30 UTC, so that would be a good time to transfer all of our lines to. Just like you would with a running fix, you can apply your course and speed to the time difference you want to transfer. For example, in the case of Doobie, we took the site at 8, 32, and 15 seconds, so 2 minutes 15 seconds after 8.30. The distance that the ship travelled in that time was 0.45 miles, using the speed of 12 knots that we declared earlier. To turn the 8, 32, 15 position line from Doobie into an 8, 30, position fix line, I need to drag it back the way the ship has come, by 0.45 miles. In our case we were travelling 000 degrees, or due north, so I need to transfer this position fix line 0.45 miles south to turn it into an 830 transferred position fix line. If we do this with all of our celestial lines of position, we can get them all at the same time and actually produce a fix. I'm going to return to our table and add in the time difference between the fixed line and each actual site time. I'm also going to add the distance that the ship travelled in that time, and that's just using speed equals distance over time. Now we can return to our diagram and plot each one in turn. 
Arcturus was shot at 8, 30 and 30 seconds. So we need to drag him back 0.1 miles to turn him into an 8.30 position fix. The azimuth was 0.82 and the intercept was 4.5 miles towards. So that puts our transferred line of position just here. We already now have an indication of where the lines are crossing, but we need to continue to get enough accuracy for a reliable fix. The third star was Regulus, taken at 8.28, 15 seconds. So that was before our 8.30 position fix. We need to move his origin ahead by 0.35 miles to turn him into an 8.30 fix. From his origin, we plot his azimuth of 156 degrees, and then we add his intercept of 3.9 miles towards. Now you can see all the lines crossing, and they're making a triangle, which we call a cocked hat. The size of this cocked hat indicates the accuracy of the fix. R1 today is relatively small, so we expect a high degree of accuracy. If it was larger, you may need to resolve that cocked hat for more accuracy. Had we plotted this directly onto a chart, you could simply add a circle to indicate that it's a fix. Then you add the time, 0830 UTC or 630 ship's time. I generally prefer to do all of this on a separate sheet, so we then need to do some sailing calculations to get the latitude and longitude of our position. All you need to do is measure the bearing and the range to the fix from the DR position, so 110 degrees and 5.1 miles in our case. We can then construct the sailing triangle to find the position fix. Our DR was at 29 degrees, 42.2 minutes north, 037 degrees, 02.5 minutes west. The angle that we're interested in here is 20 degrees, which is just 110 minus 90. Then trigonometry gives us the lengths of the sides. 5.1 cos 20 in the easterly direction, and 5.1 sine 20 in the southerly direction. And resolving those gives 4.8 and 1.7 miles. Latitude corresponds directly, so we can just subtract 1.7 minutes of latitude from our DR position to get the latitude of the fix. 29 degrees 42.2 minus 1.7 minutes equals 29 degrees 40.5 minutes north. Longitudes are a little harder as they, they change with latitude. For this, we want the average latitude. So we add the latitude of the DR, 29 degrees, 42.2 minutes, to the latitude of the fix, 29 degrees, 40.5 minutes. Then we divide by two to get the average or mean latitude. The mean lat in this case is 29 degrees, 41.4 minutes. To turn our easterly distance into a change in longitude, we divide it by cos of the mean lat. So 4.8 miles of distance divided by cos 29, 41.5 minutes, equals 5.5 minutes of longitude. We are moving in an easterly direction, so we need to subtract 5.5 minutes from 37 degrees, 0.25 minutes, to get a final longitude of 036 degrees, 57.0 minutes west. Our final fix is then 29 degrees, 40.5 minutes north, 036 degrees, 57.0 minutes west, which can be plotted straight onto the chart or put directly into the logbook. If you followed all the way through this video, you've now completed a full celestial position fix. It really shows the beauty of mathematics in the real world. You can use stars to find your position anywhere at sea. Do let me know in the comments section below if you've found this video useful, if there are any parts that could do with expansion in another video, or if you would just like to see further position fixes in different situations or using different methods. Otherwise, hopefully you've enjoyed the topic. Until next time, thank you for watching and goodbye.